covering uh, Broadway, as I do all these years, I've met some um, rather colorful characters, egomaniacs, lunatics, um, deeply insecure people. But of all the writers and the actors and the directors I've met, by far the most insane people I have ever come across are the members of the New York Drama Critics Circle. <laughs> I don't mean the members today. Uh, the members today are rather a l shabby lot, a little Laputian lot. I mean the old critics that I knew when I was just beginning, who were real lions in this town, whose reviews opened and closed shows, whose reviews destroyed careers. I think of uh, my wonderful old friend, uh, William A. Henry III from Time Magazine, who was a man of uh, Falstaffian appetites. He would um, eat creme brulee for breakfast and Princeton male interns for lunch at the Time Warner Building. I think of my old friend, uh, John Simon, who's still with us, who uh, came to this country from Yugoslavia when he was 15 years old, who graduated from Harvard with his PhD when he was 24, but who never managed to lose his Vlad the Impaler accent. <laughs> and was often fond of quoting his own best reviews over dinner. I remember uh, he reviewed a play in which Diana Rigg appeared nude, and he said, she is built like a Roman basilica with insufficient flying buttresses. But of all those colorful characters, uh, the one who was my great, great friend, who taught me a lot about life, was a fellow named Jacques Lesourd, which is a wonderful name for a critic. Jacques Lesourd. As you can do, deduce from the name, he was Chinese. <laughs> in fact, French. Born and raised in Paris. Came here when he was 15 or 16 as well, with his mother and his stepfather. And uh, Jacques went to the University of Chicago. He wore a blue blazer and a tie in the 60s when everybody was rebelling against conformity. And he was the opposite, always. He was a contrarian. And so if you wore your hair long, he cut his hair short. If you wore a tie-dyed shirt, he wore a blue blazer. Jacques made no bones about the fact that he was gay. As he used to say, I was um, gay as a goose in the womb. He had vague ambitions to be a television anchorman, but the world, when he came along, was not ready for a gay French Dan Rather. So after college, he wound up uh, at uh, Gidnet Newspapers in White Plains where he was assigned to cover uh, the courts and the police. He was very tall and very elegant. He always had his suit and his tie on, and he wore tortoise shell glasses. And the policeman in Westchester always called him Clark, as in Clark Kent. He had the unfortunate habit of driving drunk all over Westchester in a big old Lincoln Continental, circa 1971. And he'd be weaving this way and that way on the road, and the police would pull him over. And they'd do him. They'd say, oh, Clark, it's you. Get home safe. And he once said to me, you know, Riedel, my fun was spoiled when this thing called Mothers Against Drunk Driving came along. <laughs> Jacques never wanted to be a theater critic. He had no interest in the theater. But one day, he was sitting at his desk, writing up something about the police blotter. And the editor walked by, and this was 1975, and the editor said to him, Jacques, you're a fag. We need a play covered tonight. Do you want to do it? <laughs> the play was Chicago in 1975, the great Bob Fosse musical, and Jacques went and uh, he wrote his first review. He didn't really much care about the theater, but the lifestyle of being a critic back then suited him. He would get up around four in the afternoon, drive into the city in his big Lincoln Continental, go to the openings, back then critics went to the openings, and then he would dash over to uh, the Pan Am building where Gannett had its New York City newspaper, its uh, New York City headquarters, and he would write his review. 
And after that, he would then go to Studio 54, where he would do a massive amount of quaaludes, <laughs> dance the night away, drive home completely smashed, be pulled over by the side of the road, and the police would say, oh, Clark, it's you. Get home safe. He never really liked being a critic. He never really liked the theater. But he stuck with it for 37 years. And the thing that bothered him the most was he believed that critics should always present themselves as dignified people. He never appeared at the theater without his Hermes ties and his cashmere blue blazers. And he despised one of his colleagues, Frank Rich, because Frank dressed like he was a little Harvard graduate student with no tie. And he could almost, almost strangle Ben Brantley when Ben came along. And he used to say to me, he always called me Riedel, Riedel. He looks as if he's been rolling around in his fireplace all day. He used to call him Pig Pen Ben Brantley. He believed in upholding the tradition of the critic who had power, who had dignity. He also believed in the critic who drank before he went to the plays. He believed in going to Sardi's or Joe Allen and having a couple of martinis, which he said, I can only judge a play after I am well lubricated. And then, of course, after the play, we would meet at Joe Allen's and have uh, a few vodka stingers here and there. And one night, we um, stumbled out of Joe Allen's, a little bit in our cups. And there was a gentleman walking in front of us, and Jacques noticed a pair of handcuffs swinging beneath him. And he said, Riedel. Look, handcuffs. And he said to the gentleman, cuff me, baby, cuff me. And out of nowhere, men came running. And what apparently had happened was that there was a drug bust about to go on the corner of 46th and 8th Avenue. But Jacques had disrupted it because he'd seen the cuffs swinging. So the drug dealers ran away, and the undercover policemen descended on us, threw us up against the wall of the local one union headquarters, I kid you not, and started frisking us. And Jacques kept saying, frisk me, baby, frisk me. <laughs> they let us go with, uh, with no repercussions. Um, I learned a lot about reporting from Jacques. I remember um, we used to have lunch every Friday. He had a table, table seven, in the corner of Joe Allen. And we would meet there every Friday at 1 o'clock. And in 1993, um, we were waiting for him. And we got a phone call before cell phones uh, behind the bar. And they said, uh, Jacques is on the phone for you, Michael. I said, yes. He said, Radel, I can't make it. Something has blown up at the World Trade Center. And this was the first bomb, if you remember, in the basement of the World Trade Center. And uh, his editors at Gannett, up in White Plains, had assigned him to cover the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. So he had to scoot down to the World Trade Center to figure out what was going on. So scooting for Jacques was um, not something he often did. He moved very deliberately and very slowly. So he put on his Hermes tie and his cashmere blazer, and he quaffed his hair, and he hailed a cab. But of course, you could not get down there. So at about 60th or 59th Street on 5th Avenue, he got stuck. So he decided to get out and have his hair cut at Bergdorf Goodman. <laughs> and then he meandered over to Joe Allen, where we were all waiting for him. And he walked in and he said, Riedel, I couldn't get down here. Can I have a martini, please? And then he said, could you turn on the television? The bartender turned on the television, and there was wall-to-wall -wall coverage of this bombing in the basement of the World Trade Center. So Jacques took a few sips of his martini, and he went to the payphone, and he was watching the television. And he phoned his editor at White Plains, and he said, I'm on the site. And then he proceeded to repeat everything Gabe Pressman from NBC said about the bombing of the World Trade Center to his editor. 
in between sips of his martini. A year later, Gannett won the Pulitzer Prize for spot news reporting in which Jacques shared. Jacques always lived well. He lived with his mother for 25 years, which should tell you quite a bit about him. And she became sick around 2008 when the um, economy collapsed. And just as his mother was in the hospital, his editors called him from Gannett and said, uh, you're out of a job. He was kicked to the curb after 37 years at that newspaper with a six-month severance and a rather paltry pension. And he said to me, I'm an old Bentley that nobody can afford. But I have one purpose, and that is to take care of my mother before she dies. He would not let her go into a hospital. He would not let her go into a nursing home. He hired round-the-clock care. And he had no job and no apparent income. We all assumed that he was rich. His mother was Parisian. They seemed to have lived well. He knew his foie gras and his tawny ports and his Bordeaux and his burgundy and his beloved Boodle's martinis. But he did tell me, the money will run out. And when it runs out, I'm going to throw myself over the balcony. And I knew enough all these years knowing him not to um, get in his way. He did what he wanted to do. And then one day he called me and said, the money's run out. His mother had died. He'd gotten some inheritance from her. And he said, this is it. And I said, well, call me when it's over. And about two hours later, he did call me. And I said, Jacques, what happened? He said, well, Riedel, I bought a step stool so he could get up over the railing. And he said, I, I stepped on the first rung, and I got, I got vertigo. And I had to take a nap. And when I woke up, I didn't want to kill myself. And I said, well, what are you going to do now? He said, I don't know. He was evicted from his apartment two months later. He hadn't paid the rent in a year. I pulled some strings and got a space for him in the actor's home in New Jersey. And I went to him. I had to take him out to lunch at Union Square Cafe because his lifestyle never changed. And I said, Jacques, I've got good news. I've got a space for you at the actor's home in New Jersey. And he looked at me and said, Riedel, I'm not going to live in New Jersey. <laughs> Somehow managed to uh, call an old friend from his studio 54 days who lived uh, in Manchester, England. And one day he announced to us all that he was moving to Manchester, England and living with his friend. He was very happy there. He called me and he had no money, nothing but his social security check. But he had a car and driver. I said, how is it possible you have a car and driver? It turns out that Muhammad, the local taxi man in this small town outside of Manchester, England, thought he was the funniest person he'd ever met and would just ferry him around with no charge. I was uh, skiing in Utah last month and I got a call from a friend of mine and she said uh, Jacques is dead. He had uh, gone to the liquor store to get his uh, gin for his nightly martini, which was actually beef eater gin. The only concession he made to his reduced circumstances was that he no longer bought Boodle's gin, but he bought beef eater gin. And he was walking home from the liquor store. He was wearing his cashmere coat and his pigskin gloves, carrying his beef eater gin. And he had a massive heart attack and was dead before he hit the sidewalk. But the gin bottle did not break. And so the theme of this evening is, um, are you for sale? I can't answer that myself, but I know that my friend Jacques was not for sale, and that's only because nobody could afford him. Thank you.